Uh, I'm going to take the role of introducing our introducer because um, I want to I want to talk for a minute about Jay Goodgold because Jay brought uh, John Butler to uh, our attention and really um, was the catalyst for this evening. <clears throat> Jay, I think, is well known to all of us. He has served in multiple positions here at Anche Emmet, whether as a as treasurer of the congregation and president of the congregation, as well as being um, a, a regular attendee on Shabbat morning, and um, probably best known as Michael Goodgold's father, <laughs> who everyone nods their head. Um, who is our favorite Baal Shacharit on the high holidays. But here's what you might not know about Jay. Jay holds a BA from John Hopkins University, an MBA from the Stern School of Business in New York. You also may not know that after graduating, Jay uh, worked at Goldman Sachs, um, served as managing director of its St. Louis and Chicago offices. The other thing you might not know about Jay is that he is an avid historian. He reads voluminously and has <clears throat> taken a position and been quite active with the Organization of American Historians, which is a extremely important organization in the world in which we live. I think we can all agree that we would be a better country if we knew our history better. And uh, this is a message that um, I think we all need to take to heart. The people like John Butler, who have had such a distinguished career, a career as a historian has made this world a little bit better and made our country stronger and has educated generations. And so it's my pleasure to uh, turn the program over to Jay with our thanks for all you do. And let me also add that Jay is a, has been a leader at CJDS, a leader at the Cove School as well. And um, for your leadership, Jay, we are indebted to you. So take it away. Thank you, Rabbi. Really, very humbling words from you, and I really appreciate that. And uh, uh, I've been very fortunate to get to know John for a number of years, as the Rabbi alluded to the Organization of American Historians, where John was its president, you know, in the year 2015, 2016. And he and I worked together. I as treasurer, he is president. He knows a lot more than I do. So I, uh, I'm grateful for the friendship that I've had with him. And John is a uh, remarkable individual and a remarkable historian who uh, I consider to be, you know, one of the, if not the most foremost historians of religion in America uh, that right now in, 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 our, in our nation. A little background, John uh, was born in rural Minnesota. I believe John on a farm um, and had did his uh, bachelor's and his PhD at the University of Minnesota. And he has a connection here in Chicago, where for a number of years, he was a, uh, a professor at the University of Illinois of Chicago. Uh, for a number of years, he raised his family here and some of his family remains here in the Chicago area. So there is a nice connection here. And then in the mid eighties, he went to Yale University where he became the Howard Lamar Professor, Emer professor now Emeritus of, Eth of American Studies uh, and, and Religious Studies at Yale. And he's also currently now a professor of history at the University of Minnesota. John, as I mentioned, is known for his research on the role of religion in early American history, and not just the early Americans, but across the whole board in American history. And when you read his, if you have a chance to read his works, it's amazingly wide ranging what you'll see. His knowledge goes from the Puritans, religion with Puritans, to the founding fathers, to Adam Clayton Powell, to Ar uh, Abraham Joshua Heschel, among others. So it's, it's an amazingly wide ranging role. While at Yale, he served as chair of the American Studies Program from 1988 to, 80, to 1993. He was director of the Division of Humanities 
He was also the chair of the history department. He was also the dean of the graduate school from like 2004 to 2010. And they made him the university librarian for a while, which I know John, was, as he mentioned me, was always amazed that they would pick him, but I can't think of a better person who would be the university librarian for the whole Yale uh, operations. He's won numerous awards, among them the Beverage Award, one of the most prestigious awards in the world of American history, awards for, from the American Society of Church History, um, from the French Historical Society. And I would just say, you know, when, when, you, re when you read his books, you'll see a wide range of knowledge. And John has really made a, a huge contribution to our understanding of religion, particularly at the founding of this country, uh, where it stood. And I just will just uh, give you a comment that he, he wrote in, a, um, in, his, he, in an interview where he said, talking about the founding fathers, he said their view of religion was really a view that stressed ethics and morals rather than a direct divine intervention. Now, John could go more into that explanation, but I think for all of us here at Anshay Emmet, we would appreciate those words from John. And um, I'm just grateful to have John here on, this, on our program. I'm delighted, uh, first of all, that he's a friend and that he's able to share his wonderful new book, God in Gotham. And for those who are from Manhattan or not from Manhattan, I think you'll find this to be a, a very, very enlightening book about religion in the late 8th, 19th century into the, well, into the mid part of the 20th century. Uh, for those who have questions, please use the chat. Uh, it's there so John can see the questions and he can answer them for you. And John, please go ahead with your uh, discussion. Thank you, Jay. Uh, I'm honored to be here. I have great memories of teaching at what then was called Chicago Circle from 1975 to 1985. Our two boys were born at Michael Reese Hospital in Chicago, which is now sadly closed. Uh, so we had 10 wonderful years um, in Chicago. We lived in Oak Park. And uh, our younger son lives in Skokie. So, um, and is a, a social worker at Evanston High School. So um, we, have, we still have a connection, very strong connection. And I'm only missing the fact that we can't get on a plane anymore and just go see them. <laughs> so, uh, you know, now we do FaceTime just like this, you know, so, so and thank goodness we have that. So thanks. Uh, I just want to say that uh, for those who don't know, the rabbi mentioned this, but Jay has been a really a godsend, I'm going to say that, to the Organization of American Historians because he straightened out the, its finances. And uh, you know, uh, historians aren't really very good with money. <laughs> I'm sorry to say that, but they're, they're not. And I say that myself. So, um, but Jay just came in and said, well, we need to, we should do this. And we should do that and we should. So, and, and he keeps doing that. And including the, you know, some of the downfall of the, that came with the pandemic. So he was, he's really adept at this. And, um, I say, thank goodness for someone who knows and is willing to do this um, for an organization like ours. So let me just say a word about the, my book. And um, so this is a book about religion in modern Manhattan from the 1880s to about the 1960s. And you can say, well, why did I write it? And what, what, so what? Why do we want to, why should we care about this? Well, one of the reasons we should care about it is that in general, we don't think about religion. We, when we think about religion in American history, we think about the Puritans, or maybe we think about the abolitionists. And yes, we think about immigration in the 1880s to the 1920s, but then we sort of forget about what happens after that, you know, whatever, whatever religion sort of disappears from American history. If you were to look at a textbook, nothing much happens in religion from according to American history textbooks, most of them, from the mid 1920s until Jerry Falwell, for better or worse, probably worse, shows up on the scene. And that's a kind of jack in the box. It's like, woo, it pops up here. And what happened? Where, where did it come from? How do, you, how do we get here? Um, and I was interested in Manhattan because I, uh, 
I'm a, I grew up in a rural Minnesota town of a thousand people and what rural Minnesotan, um, young person, a young man, a young woman isn't fascinated by cities. We, we were all agog about Minneapolis and then we were, took a senior class trip to New York City and whoo, you know, that, that sort of cemented things for me as far as I'm concerned. So we lived, we stayed in a sort of semi-ratty hotel across from the, from the, it, the called the Roosevelt Hotel, across from the theater that was then showing West Side Story. That's 1958. Well, I mean, I've been hooked ever since. So, the, but the reason the historian would want to study Manhattan is that it's sort of the, you know, aside from Hollywood, it's the capital of American secularism. You can think of it as that. You know, people don't think of, when they think of Manhattan, they don't think of religion too much, especially in the 20th century. They should, and I try to describe why. They should if they walk down any Manhattan street, walk up Park Avenue, walk up Fifth Avenue, walk, up, walk any of the side streets, 58th Street, 78th Street, 43rd Street, walk anywhere you want to and you'll find religious organizations stuffed into strange locations that don't look like they do in the country. They're, they're smashed into narrow spaces, little spaces, and they're all over the place. No one's ever counted them. Just in Manhattan alone, there are easily a thousand, maybe 1,500. And the question is, where do these come from? Well, my question was, especially if people think that religion died in the city, religion died in modernity. The great German sociologist, Max Weber thought that religion was, uh, was simply going to disappear in modern times. It wasn't going to be around. The, the world was becoming disenchanted, he said. There weren't any more miracles. There, weren't any, there, there wasn't any religiosity. Religiosity was just, was just dying. He actually made a trip to America in 1904, and he spent two weeks in New York City. And the little that we know about it, we know something about it mainly because his wife took notes, he didn't. But from her notes, what we know is that, that when, they went to, when they went to religious services, they weren't impressed. And they thought that mainly these organizations were slowly dying on the vine. If he, he died in 1919, of pneumonia, he was only 56 years old. But if he had come to New York in the 1920s or even in the middle of the depression in the 1930s, he would have been astonished because he, what he was seen and what I try to describe in this book is a plethora of extraordinary sanctuaries, large ones, small ones, medium-sized ones. What he would have found was that these sanctuaries were all over the place, everywhere. What he would have found is that New Yorkers were, uh, all except for Orthodox Jews, were taking the subway to go to them. In other words, they, and why? They begin to advertise. So they begin to advertise, actually, in the middle of the 19th century. They already started advertising. By the 1880s, they're advertising regularly. And um, then what are they doing? They're appealing to people. That, the, the, these, these congregations are no longer just appealing to people who can walk to the synagogue can walk to the to the church, can walk to the sanctuary, and um, New Yorkers are attending worship services by the by the thousands, half a million, seven hundred thousand, a million on a weekend. They're using the streets. They're using newspapers. They quickly take to radio. Uh, when it comes along, they quickly take to television. And um, religiosity is all over the place. And then there's the question of theology. So New York City becomes the unlikely spiritual hothouse of the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. Think of the great figures. Think of the great figures in Judaism. Uh, Heschel, Kaplan, Soloveitchik, Think of, Mar th think of the great figures in Christianity, Niebuhr, Tillich, uh, for better or, or worse, Norman Vincent Peale, uh, Dorothy Day in Catholicism, and a sort of obscure figure not known to very many, but very important between 1941 and 1945, and that is Europe's best known Catholic philosopher, Jacques Maritain, 
was exiled in the city during, the, during World War II, and he was extraordinarily active in New York City's religious life, including especially at the Jewish Theological Seminary. Why? Because the Jewish Theological Seminary was hosting conferences on the relationship between religion, philosophy, and democracy. And Maritain was exceptionally involved in these conferences. In fact, I will tell you that the only, in, in my book, the, the picture that I used the only picture that I know of that comes from the 1940s of Maritain in the United States came from the Jewish Theological Seminary. Regrettably, it's 1948. I really wanted one from, 19, from, the, from the wartime period, but we couldn't find one. And I had great help from a historian at the Jewish Theological Seminary named Jack Wertheimer to find those, to find that single picture. Um, so it becomes a hothouse. Un unparalleled in America's history. No other place in the United States in the 1930s and 40s was such a theological hothouse as urban Manhattan. And so that's what the book tries to describe. And then the last chapter is about suburbanization. And if you want to know why all the so many Chicago suburbs, and I mean the post-World War II suburbs, not the post, not the 1890s suburbs like Evanston or Oak Park, okay? But I mean the post-World War II. Why are they so dotted with sanctuaries? Because in, as in, in, in Manhattan, as in Chicago, people were taking, moving to the suburbs and they were taking their urban religion with them. And there really would have been, without this flourishing of religiosity in this urban setting, it's not clear to me as a historian where, what would have happened to religion in the suburbs. So th th there's an irony. In the 1890s, most religious leaders worried. They were worried sick. What was gonna happen to religion in this an anonymous, dense, increasingly secularizing society? Would it even be here? By the 1950s, um, some scholars, some scholars, actually I will say not very good ones, <laughs> some scholars thought, well, there was too much religion in the suburbs. And especially it was all of the wrong kind because what did people in the suburbs want? They just wanted belonging. That's what they saw in the congregation. They wanted to belong. And was that enough? Well, we, we won't go into that. But that's a big question. <laughs> what does what is it meant by a congregation? What do people expect from congregational life? Um, so the book ends uh, with the suburbs and the explosion of religi religious uh, sanctuaries that take place in suburbs all around Manhattan, in New Jersey and on Long Island, and even as, you know in, in Connecticut as well. So that's what the book is about. It's about the flourishing of religion at a time in decades when. Theor theoreticians and religious leaders really were already prophesying its, de its death and failure. Uh, in the 1890s, they, they thought it wasn't going to go anywhere. And yet here it is. So I will tell you, I'm, I'm a country boy uh, who, who loved writing, who loved researching this book a little bit too much. <laughs> and it took me longer to do than, than, than I had planned. But in any case, um, I love doing it. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have or Jay wants to pose to me or that Rabbi Siegel wants to pose to me. I'm happy to start. Um, the transition that Heschel had to make, um, he was originally saved by um, Hebrew Union College and originally started out in Cincinnati, Ohio. So here is Heschel in uh, the bastion of reform Judaism in Cincinnati. And ultimately um, it wasn't a good match and he, came, he went to JTS. But when he went to JTS in the period that he went to, went, went there, there was a whole unsung, unsung story that Louis Finkelstein had created uh, this 
meeting place for Jews and Christians uh, at JTS, I mean, creating an institute for that purpose that I think um, uh, had, a, had a deep and lasting impact on the ecumenical life of American Jewry. But as you note, it could have only taken place in New York City. So it was really a happy coincidence. But I'd, I'd like you to, if you would, <clears throat> to talk a little bit more about Heschel and Heschel in New York. So um, you, you know, you're quite right. Heschel felt uncomfortable in Cincinnati. It just wasn't his place. And um, he wasn't always comfortable at JTS either. Um, but uh, the question is, where would he go? What he was comfortable with in, in New York, I think, was um, the opportunities for an intellectual life that, uh, with all due respect, he didn't find in Cincinnati, a larger intellectual life that he didn't find in Cincinnati, but he did find New York. And one of his partners ultimately was the great Protestant theologian Reinhold Niebuhr. And when Niebuhr died, Heschel gave the eulogy for at, at uh, Niebuhr's funeral. And Heschel really blossomed from being a, a relatively, if I may say, traditional Jewish scholar, Talmudic scholar, to becoming a philosopher of religion. And that happened in Manhattan. And I think that I think his ability to ingest all of the creative energy that came from being an intellectual in, in an urban place where he had contact with people from Union Theological Seminary, especially, uh, on some contact with Tillich, um, he, he, he really blossomed. Absolutely. And um, it, 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 he became, as I explain in the book, and by the time of, uh, by, the, by the 1960s, it is arguably true that he was the best known rabbi in America. Right. And he, and I think that is true. And then what sealed it, of course, was the famous picture, uh, there are actually several pictures, <laughs> uh, but the famous picture of him marching in the Selma, uh, in, the, in the Selma march with Martin Luther King. Right. And, and, as, and then his comment, he said, I was praying with my feet. And that comment is, is among the, the most repeated comments in textbooks, in books on American culture, books on American religion uh, in the late 20th century. There's hardly a book on that subject that doesn't repeat that comment from Heschel and that doesn't also uh, include the picture of, um, or one of the several different pictures uh, uh, of, of Heschel marching, marching in the parade. Yeah, and, and I think it's fair to say that um, that, that experience, the New York experience really turned Heschel into a different kind of scholar and a different kind of intellectual and a, a person with a profoundly broad influence in, in modern American in modern American intellectual life. I think your point is well taken and I think that it should be known that when he, that that the seminary itself was not a particularly open institution intellectually. Um, uh, Saul Lieberman, the great maybe the greatest Talmudist of the 20th century was um, was, was at JTS and ruled the, the seminary and uh, would refer to Heschel not as a philosopher, but he would call him the poet, which was not a compliment to him. In other words, he didn't see him as a scholar. So ironically, um, Heschel was, was probably better received, right? and uh, more at home, ironically, at Union Theological Seminary than at the Jewish Theological Seminary. 
you know, Heschel wasn't alone. Uh, Kaplan didn't have such always. Uh, Mordecai Kaplan didn't always have, was, was at the seminary for decades That's and didn't always have a pleasant relationship with his colleagues yeah. or with the seminary in general. Both, ironically, both, both Kaplan and Heschel had tensions with the, with the seminary but they also had tensions with each other. <laughs> so it isn't as though that, that, that those tensions drew them together. They didn't really draw them together at all. Mm -hmm. uh, they just each had their own parallel tensions uh, with the seminary. That said, uh, look, at the, look at the achievement of the seminary, whatever be the internal tensions of the seminary. The seminary's achievements um, were really striking. And the set, first the set of ecumenical conferences that uh, Finkelstein promoted, and then these uh, wartime era conferences on religion, democracy, and philosophy that they that they promoted that that he promoted uh, were really transformative, not so much for American intellectual life. I have to say that they 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 weren't, but they were transformative for the participants for the people who participated. And that was true for Catholic participants, especially because it's, the Catholics were much more wary of relationships with both Protestants and Jews than Jews were wary of those same relationships where Protestants were wary of those same relationships. Mm. The ca Catholics tended to, be very, tended to be very protective of their own interests. And, um, and, but for those who participated, those Catholics who did participate in the conferences, the, the conferences really helped them bring other Catholics along in a way that we don't always uh, appreciate. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the seminary was the sponsor for this. The, this these were the seminary's conferences. The, the conference after World War II, the conferences just, if I may say, sort of <laughs> degenerated into just rather run-of-the-mill academic conferences. And uh, no one read their proceedings and no one paid much attention to them. And the Times, New York Times and the Herald Tribune stopped writing about them. But, but, but in the 40s, they, they, they got, the conferences got a lot of attention and, and rightly so. Let's turn our attention to the questions that are in the chat. There's some good ones. Um, Julian asks, why was the increased, why, why, why was there an increased growth in religion in the 1920s? Well, I think at the, uh, let me take that back. The question is, why is there an increased growth in religion uh, in, let's say, from the 80s into the 20s? Because that's where that starts. It comes from immigration. It comes from the, what I discuss in the book, the extraordinary proliferation of tiny congregations, Jewish congregations. There may have been, uh, by 1915, 1918, when the, the Kahila did a survey, they counted 800 congregations. Many of them had virtually no more than a million, but they counted sort of 800 and they knew that they missed others. So there are probably easily 900 or a thousand Jewish congregations in the city, but especially concentrated in Manette. Why? The almost all of those congregations were very tiny congregations of groups of uh, groups Jew, groups of Jews who came from the same immigrating emigrating regions of Eastern Europe from Russia from Poland from the Eastern European states and they they were worshiping with people they knew they wanted to they wanted to worship with people they knew the second generation is the generation that founds most of the most of the post-1900 congregations whose synagogues still remain in the city, whose synagogues were built in the 19, 1910s, 1920s, up, up to, and a few, even past, uh, even past the collapse of the stock market. Or are those congregations that expanded and sold their buildings to Protestant organizations or especially in Har Harlem or the areas around Harlem, sold them to black congregations. So, and the same thing could be true. We could say, oh, well, this was, this was unique to Jews. No, it was not. Um, 
Protestant congregations advertised there were Norwegian Protestant there was a Norwegian Protestant congregation, a Czech Protestant congregation. There were most of the congregations formed in in New York City from the 1880s and 1920s were ethnic congregations. Virtually all of them were ethnic congregations in their initial in their initial formation. And we could say, well, but maybe there's an exception, and that is migrating blacks because the period from 1880 witnesses the first large scale migration of blacks from the American South and the Caribbean, that's very important. The Caribbean is important um, to the city, to Manhattan especially, uh, where most of them are concentrated. And what do, what do black congregations advertise? They advertise for worshipers from Virginia. They advertise, they held South Carolina Day they too, what were they doing? They were appealing to the same sentiment that these small Jewish congregations, some of these Protestant congregations, and now black Protestant congregations are doing, they're appealing to people's sentiments. Where did you grow up? Who do you know? Would you want to worship with people who are quote, like you? And that accounts, uh, in my opinion, that accounts for the for this sustaining congregational life in the city and then expanding it because the, the congregations then serve social functions. Many of them, many of them became also insurance societies, or they helped you find a doctor, or they or they helped you uh, with a job, or they helped you uh, uh, deal with it with uh, with anti-Semitism or anti-black sentiments or dealing with a mean employer. And who did that? Well, a rabbi did that, a minister did that, a congregational member did that. Congregations were scenes of vital social life. And thus, that, that reinforced worship. And it really reinforced the ability of these groups also to raise money because the people felt they should contribute. And then, then, that, then they all became, interestingly, they all became, unlike the, the case in rural areas, they became really adept at, cre at buying lots, tearing down buildings, merging properties, uh, buying and selling congregations, buying and selling sanctuaries, I should say. Jews sold sanctuaries to Blacks, Blacks sold sanctuaries to whites. White Protestants sold some sanctuaries to a few Jews. And everywhere, most of these groups at one time or another also rented. So the renting experience for immigrant Jews in the 1880s, most of the 800 to 1,000 congregations in Manhattan, especially in concentrated mostly in Manhattan, were held their meetings in, in rental quarters. They weren't what for blacks would call storefront churches, which were on the street. You walked up a brownstone into a building. Most of the, of the Jewish congregations met on the second and third floors in apartments or someone's apartment or apartment that they rented for a month or two months or six months or a year. Everybody had a rental experience. And the one group that was different were Catholics. Why? Catholics were, it's very clear that Catholics were given to building very large sanctuaries. So what, so you won't find most, most of the Catholic churches in Manhattan and in the boroughs are, are quite large. Catholics became the Archdiocese of New York, organized all of this, and they became experts in putting together small pieces of property so they could own half a block on which they could then sink a very large sanctuary. Then they would buy more property on the same block. Why? They would want to build a school. And intriguingly, if you look at the, at the Catholic schools, they look a lot, architecturally, they don't look like the churches at all. They look like public school buildings. They emulate the architecture of the public school buildings. So I found that I found that interesting. So so that's a long-winded answer to explain how do we get all this organization, and whatnot. It really comes out of this desire to meet other people, worship with other people, 
entertain other people, uh, a feeling of camaraderie, a feeling of engaging in familiar ritual. And that's what sustains this congregational life and not, not to, to sustain it, it propels it to new levels. So when you add that to the success, the financial success of, of many immigrant groups, most the most famous are, are uh, emigrating Jews, but emigrating Catholics could be very successful. And they would go to the save their money at the Emigrant Savings Bank. The historian recently has really documented the degree to which small Irish, Irish workers saved a lot of money so they could buy. And so they, they weren't just, so, so it isn't just one immigrant group, it's many immigrant groups who are saving money and then they can build bigger buildings, build bigger sanctuaries. And that's what, that's what leads to the flourishing, the, the, the physical flourishing as well as the psychological and sociological flourishing of the religious experience in modern Manhattan. Mm. Barry Seaskin asks, it's clear that Max Weber's predictions for religious life were wrong. Did he simply misread or misunderstand what he observed? Or did something else change that he did not foresee? Very good question. My inclination is to think the following, and that is, Weber was German, and he was a pretty good reader of what was happening to religion in Germany in the 1880s, the 1890s, and the 1900s. Religion, religious worship in Germany was deeply class-based, whether that was Catholic worship or Protestant worship, um, that, that is for, for Christians. And uh, in the meantime, uh, everybody knew that, as I also discussed in this book, the level of, of attendance at Catholic and German Protestant services kept sinking. It sank lower and lower and lower as you move from the 1860s or 70s or from German, from the unification of Germany into the 20th century. It kept, it kept sinking. And that was what was on Weber's mind. And Weber was sort of stuck with an idea also that religion flourished in rural areas. So when he came to America in 1904, instead of looking for a religion, instead of looking initially, he landed in New York, as everybody would, most people. And but the first thing he did was he he went to upstate New York. Why did he go to upstate New York? He wanted to see a German congregation in the rural area. He, he should have gone. He should have gone, to, he should have wandered around Manhattan a little bit. And even when he came back at the end of his tour of America, um, he didn't do much of that. He just, he just had a mindset to think that religion was not going to survive in an urban place. And he makes various critical comments about, um, he went to a Christian science service and he thought it was boring. He thought the American congregations were being displaced by so by by the by the YMCA's and YWCA's the Christians, and he didn't see them as very uh, Christian organizations, although they actually were at that time. Um, so uh, he was just he just he he just misread he mis he read the American situation with German eyes. And he couldn't, he didn't really see what he could have seen uh, if he had tried a little bit harder, but that's, that's what he did. But that's, a, that's a great question. Mm. Barry Balak asks, how much do you think the ups and downs of religiosity in New York coincided with the waves of immigration, particularly from Europe? Uh, very good. That, that's also a great question. So, um, I'm inclined to think, of course, that um, immigration propelled religion. It's immigration that renews it. It's the arrival of new people who are feeling lonely and anxious, and many of them coming from only modest urban backgrounds, and now look where they are in Manhattan. Uh, and there, there are a really a lot of people in Manhattan. It was one thing to, 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 to come from a German city, let's say, of 100,000 people or 150,000 people. 
and come to a city like Manhattan. So um, immigration really fuels religiosity. It does that with blacks coming from the American South and from the Caribbean. It clearly fuels their, their, their they, they rush to black congregations and the black congregations grow because of that. Some of them, a few of them are a little resistant just as some synagogues were resistant. Old line synagogues in the 1880s in, in New York weren't always welcoming. So immigrants just created their own worship services. Mm -hmm. They didn't depend necessarily on the older, older synagogues. Uh, and this, that was true for Protestants as well. So mm -hmm. ethnic Protestants coming from, coming from Europe, from Wales, from, from Britain, from Scotland, uh, all, all also uh, formed congregations in the city. They didn't necessarily join Trinity Church. Okay, if they were if they were Anglicans, they, they didn't want to go to Trinity Church. <laughs> Trinity Church was the you know old line American Protestant. They they wanted sort of Welsh Protestant. They wanted Scottish Protestant. That's what they wanted, and that's what they that's what they got. And that's what they created. They created that, and um, a long long time ago. A historian by the name of Timothy Smith, who passed away long, quite a few years ago, uh, who briefly taught at the University of Minnesota when I was a graduate student, made the observation in a famous article in the American Historical Review that immigration actually accelerated religious sensibility and belonging from European migrants as they moved to America. In other words, they, in other words, they, he he said. And this may be a little overstatement. He said people, they were more religious in America than they had been at home. And it's a, it's a kind of challenging idea because we imagine, oh, the old world, that's where, that's where there was religion, but in America, hmm. well, Smith made the argument and I think he was basically right. Um, that, that is, um, that is you, immigration has a way of engendering a need for belonging. And it's that belong, sense of belonging and the, and the creativity that comes, that's generated by the sense of belonging that really uplifts religiosity and religious organization in the city. So it would have done it. I mean, I could have written about Chicago. I could have written about Cincinnati. I could have written about you know, Atlanta and whatnot. I think it's much the same story. Immigrants to Chicago amplify religiosity and uh, they're, they, they, they're, go, they're going to make it, they're going to renew it, they're going to create it. And so what you have is the urban setting is spiritually creative. Mm. And that's what, that's what happened between the 1880s and the 1920s and 1930s. Mm. The urban setting became, became spiritually creative. When we think of spiritual creativity, we, we think of people sort of wandering around the wilderness, you know, in nature, uh, being spiritually creative, you know, whatever, whatever. Well, I grew up on a farm. <laughs> well, I grew up on my, my, I grew up, my dad was a farmer. We actually lived in town. So anyway, I, don't, I won't go into that part. But in any case, I, you know, there's really nothing spiritually creative about the countryside. I'm sorry to tell you that. But, you know, a cornfield is a cornfield and what spiritual creativity happens there is beyond me. I, I never, I never saw it in my hometown, let's put it that way. So there, there are physical uh, wildernesses and there are uh, spiritual wildernesses as That's well. That's correct. Steve Derslog has a question, but I want to make sure that we get the question, question right. So Steve, would you uh, mind unmuting yourself and asking your question? Uh, yes. Um, thank you, Professor. It's a very interesting discussion. I was wondering if you thought that the Jewish Renaissance at the time you described might be due to the fact of the concentration of 25% of uh, world Jewry in a 30 mile radius of New York City at a time when Europe was ex as Jewry was experiencing great pressure from rising anti-Semitism. Was it this concentration of, of uh, Jewish uh, population that might have stimulated that renaissance? Uh, my answer to you is very straightforward, absolutely. I think that's really, it's really critical. And uh, it isn't, it, it's also uh, important to remember something else and that is 
it's, it is the variety of Judaism's present in Manhattan that's also important. It isn't just the number, but it's the variety of Judaism's present in the city. So it wasn't, you know, we, we, we tend to, tend to want to, re, tend to reduce historian, and historians are the ones who've really made this happen. We tend to want to reduce um, the complexity of a variety of religious groups, Catholics, Protestants, and Jews, into, same with Jews, to, to Orthodox reform and conservative. But the, the, the simple truth is, is that uh, if you look at the history of many congregations, congregations went from one to another. Uh, there are a variety, wide varieties among Orthodox Jews, among conservative Jews, among reformed Jews, and those varieties change over the years. And that all is stimulating rather than, um, rather than repressing religiosity. Mm -hmm. And as long as these, these groups keep, and the, when the groups keep renewing themselves, as happens, so we have a fairly, we, we often say, oh, well, migration was over by the First World War. Well, in good part, yes, but it didn't completely end. And we still have a variety of, of events happening. So, so the, the, the compactness of, of, that, of that population really does have to do with the uh, Renaissance uh, in American Judaism in 20th century Manhattan. Professor, there are questions that bring us really to a, a more contemporary moment. Uh, for instance, many of the current COVID-19 restrictions hugely impact religious gatherings. Do you think this reflects an overall marginalization of religion in the United States? No, I don't, uh, and I'll tell you why. Because I think, um, I, first of all, I do want to say the following, and that is that I am a historian, and I am not a sociologist of religion, and so I observe what you observe. So, and not much more. So, I'm not a, I'm not a sociologist who examines contemporary American religion. But I would say the following: um, from what I can see. Um, well, say from my perch in Minneapolis, okay? Maybe it's not the most urban perch in the world, but you know, whatever. Um, congregations are really reinventing themselves. Look at this event. You know, uh, you know we all know uh, that uh, six months ago, nine, nine months ago, a year ago, who knew about Zoom? Well, a few people knew about Zoom, but not very many. And um, congregations are doing that. They're you know, televising their services. They're using new means of, of connecting with other, with other people. Um, then there's the growth of the internet, for better or worse. We have a whole religiosity of the internet. And um, if we can say, we can say, uh, we can look at one factor, and that is what's, what's pulling together Iowa Republicans, who also happen to be religiously conservative, and they'll describe themselves as uh, evangelicals. Uh, what's pulling them together? You could say, well, it's because it's all those small towns, face-to-face -to -face society. That's, that is part of it in small town Iowa. But what is also pulling, what are they doing when they're not talking to each other and not wearing masks? They're on the web and they're reading, they're reading acres of websites that are giving them ideas about religiosity, about the nature of religion, about doctrine, and all kinds of people are doing that now. Every religious group has, has, a, has to have a significant website. And if you don't have a significant website, that, that in, in, in 2020, um, you are going to be, you're, you're going to be slipping away um, that was true, think of it this way. It was true if you didn't have a radio station in 1922, uh, well, what, in, in Manhattan in 1922, when all kinds of congregations got, Protestant congregations especially got radio stations, this was before the advance of, of network radio, uh, well, what was gonna happen to your congregation? And all kinds of conservative fundamentalist churches got their own 25 watt radio stations. They could broadcast for six blocks or whatever. 
Um, or they would get them in New Jersey so they could broadcast over into Manhattan and so they could cross the Hudson River. Okay, fine. Uh, they did that. So this isn't the only time when religious organizations have been pressed to really reinvent themselves. And uh, how successfully religion and religiosity and religious organizations and traditional religious views and beliefs are going to be in this as a result of this isn't clear. Um, but I'll say, I'll tell you this, you know, name, name me, tell me the name of the historian who predicted in, in 20, what, in 2000 that we would have a black president. So I don't know of any. Uh, historians are really bad. Uh, at predicting things, and I'm not going to predict anything uh, because we can't, the, the, the past is so contingent, that is filled with so many filigrees out there, and we don't know how they're all matching up. But these are very challenging times, and I, my inclination is to think that groups are finding ways to reinvent themselves and meet the challenges of, of 2020 and probably regrettably 2021 uh, in ways that are going to be very telling for the next decade or two. There's no question about it. Our own congregation is about to embark on a strategic plan to look at um, how uh, we will be transforming ourselves into a post COVID universe. And so these questions are very real and, um, and I think uh, very much on target, but as a historian, how do you understand the rise of the nuns? That is to say, those who um, identify themselves as without religion, yeah. none, um, right. or the least none that they want to identify with. How do you understand that in, in part of the historical continuum of the United States? Okay, so- and This is um, Barry Siskin's question. Yeah, so um, this is a perplexing issue. If you, if you look at uh, what we know about something that, that we'll, I'll just use a shorthand, I'll use a Christian shorthand, church membership in American history from the colonial period to the present. What you're going to find is that actual church membership uh, in, in the colonial period, but also let's say, say the early 19th century, the post-revolutionary period, was very was relatively low. Less than 40% of American adults belonged to any kind of religious organization. That's not to say they were atheists. It's not to say they were nuns. It's not to say they didn't read the Bible. It's simply to say they didn't belong to something. In part because there weren't enough congregations, it could be. And also in part, they just didn't. And we over, we exaggerate the degree of religious knowledge and religious, I'm gonna say as a historian, early modern historians that I know, the, the ones that I like, will tell you that we, when we look at the medieval period, not everybody believed. And when we look at the, at the 16th century, the 17th century, the 18th century, Martin Luther at the end of his life was absolutely appalled by the degree to which people who were supposed to be Lutherans didn't know a thing about, about the nature of Christianity. They didn't understand. He was so, he was all filled up with notions about transubstantiation, consubstantiation, and whatnot. And the kind of people sat there and just looked at him and didn't know what it was, what was he talking about. So we exaggerate the religiosity of the past. Where we see religion rising, congregational measure, membership rising is from the 1880s into the 1960s. The 1960s represent the first time that that figure crosses 50%. Now it's gone back down again, but there's a new configuration and that is we don't, we don't always know what, what non-members thought and believed before the 1940s or 50s. We really don't. We can speculate. Now we have much better information on what the nuns, uh, N-O-N-E-S, the nuns do believe. And they, they're non-doctrinal. They usually will say they believe in ethics. They usually will say they believe in morals, but they don't tie that to religion. They don't see that as connected to religion. 
Now, maybe that they're being naive. Maybe they're, we could say all kinds of things about them. You know, maybe that's a, that's a, a false foundation. Maybe they're kidding themselves, but who, who knows? But I would say that the rise of the nuns is a real challenge to all religiosity and traditional organized religion in the United States. Mm. And the question is, how does traditional organized religion meet that challenge? And I, it's not clear to me, it, it not, that, that's not my thing, okay? I can tell you about the past, but I can't, I, I wouldn't be the person you'd want to talk to about the future. Um, let, uh, our last question comes from Burl, um, Barry and Merle, starting to combine your names, Barry and Merle Gross. Um, and it's a big question, which is why doesn't the knowledge of history enable governments to not repeat the errors of the past? <laughs> and I think everyone will be listening carefully for your answer. <laughs> Well, I suppose we could say, if, if I were Reinhold Niebuhr, maybe I would say that's because we're foolish. Uh, you know, or that's because Niebuhr would have said, uh, because he was so taken with the idea of, well, it's a little exaggeration, but he was so taken with the idea of imperfect man, or as Christians called it, original sin. We just don't learn. We don't, we, we don't learn. Look at the problem we're having now with people refusing to wear masks. Look at the rejection, the level of rejection of science in our society. Or I'm going to be political and say, listen to the words of the president of the United States when he, when he, when he demeans science. You know, science has all kinds of problems. You know, I was once a, once a dean of a graduate school with big science departments and they're, you know, they have all kinds of issues in science departments and scientists don't always get along. But what do we know about science? What we know about science is that it teaches us critical lessons about what is effective in a given situation. And we know that masks are effective. They're not perfect by any means. But if, we, if, we, if I can take your question to that, just on that simple issue, then we have to say, why is it that people want to believe that these, these things are not, why do they want to believe that the pandemic is a fake or that masks don't work or that I like to choose my freedom as opposed to a mask? Then, then when we go to ethical and moral questions about race relations, about the relationships between the poor about the growing inequality in our society, about tax policy and its effects on the lives that Americans will be living because it's going to affect their incomes. A lot of it has to do, with, you know, that that. Again, I'll come back to the fact. I'll just I'll return the question and say, why is it that we keep perpetuating these these myths of ignorance, when in fact we could really be acting on the things that we learn. The, the things we learn aren't perfect. They're by no means perfect, but they are better than ignorance. And if we could, if we can do more with that, if we can do more with learning, my great criticism of our current situation is, isn't, isn't the meanness or whatnot, it's the ignorance. And it's ignorance that is our that is our greatest enemy, and it's it is not today. It's willful ignorance, and that's really that I think is the most disturbing trend of the last four years is willful ignorance. And how we're going to turn that around, we can all hope that we can turn it around. Mm. Well, this uh, thank you so much, Jay. I wanna. On behalf of all of us, I want to thank you for um, making arrangements and helping encourage this evening and giving our all of us a chance to meet Professor Butler. What a, what a rare privilege it is. I would certainly encourage you to pick up a copy of his book. It makes for fascinating reading. And um, Sin City becomes God's city in some ways, in ways that we didn't expect. Um, just a few brief announcements.
On Thursday afternoon, the forward Jewish newspaper is, uh, Jay's holding up the book, um, 